There's one song that we'll probably sing as, uh, over the course of our uh, time in Advent, but there's a line in it that says, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel. God with us, revealed in us, his name is called Emmanuel. It's probably one of the most common courses, chorus that's been around for a long, long time. But there's one thing, there's a number of things that make Christianity unique. One of the things that makes Christianity unique among the world's religions, first of all, is the doctrine of the Trinity. In other words, we believe in one God that is one God is made up in three persons, three, three persons, but yet one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And these three persons are co-equal in their attributes and in their character. They are eternally holy. They are eternal, holy, all-powerful, all-knowing and ever-present, ever-present, all sharing equally in these characteristics. They are yet, at the same time, distinct from one another. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. One theologian puts it this way, we may define the doctrine of the Trinity as follows. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God, but there is one God. Christianity is unique from the other religions of the world in another way. Nearly every other religion views humanity as essentially good. Virtually every other religion views humanity as essentially good. Any badness that is to be found is the result of something that is outside of us. Therefore, we must look inside of ourselves and strive to better ourselves so that we might attain heaven, Valhalla, Nirvana, or whatever the essence of eternal personal peace or bliss is. Christianity uniquely sees humanity as essentially bad. We are not essentially good. Therefore, because of this, the badness that is to be found in people is the result of something inside of us, not outside of us. Therefore, we must look outside of us in order to find one who is perfect, one who may redeem us from our badness, the badness that we are unwilling and unable to remove ourselves. And only in that way are we able to find true peace. Christianity is unique in another way. And that is particularly meaningful this time of year. Because of our spiritual deadness and the hardness of our hearts, we could not and we would not pursue God. Therefore, God is the one who pursued us. God is the one who initiates the relationship that is so vital for us to live lives that are fully alive, that are fully meaningful lives that God created us to live. Only, Christianity, only in Christianity do we see the eternal, infinite God breaking into time and clothing himself with humanity. Only in Christianity do we find God coming near to those who have betrayed him and have been a disobedient to him in thought, in word, and in deed. Only Christianity breathes life into the truth of Emmanuel, God is with us. Over the course of the next few weeks, we will be looking at several passages in the Gospels that are very familiar to us. These are portions of Scripture that speak to the birth of Jesus Christ. In these, we will see how God has revealed himself as the true Messiah. 
we will come to understand, I pray, a little bit more of what it means to celebrate the coming of the Lord and to know Emmanuel. This morning, we're going to touch briefly on two passages of Scripture, Luke 1, 26 through 38, and Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Don't worry, we're not going to spend Going to, not going to do a detailed study in both, so we're not going to be here for two hours. In these two sections, we will come to see that God's purpose for the coming of the Messiah involved the bringing, the bringing together of a family as God had designed it. A man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Through our time this morning, I pray that we will see how the promise of God comes through the family. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would give me the wisdom to speak your truth. Lord, I thank you that you have revealed it in your word. I thank you that your word is sufficient, that your word is infallible, that your word is inerrant, that it, your word is authoritative and that it speaks truth into our lives. God, I thank you that you still speak today to us through your word. Lord, I pray that as we are in your word this morning, that your truth might be made evident to us, that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our hearts, that you would soften the soil of our hearts so that we might receive what you would have for us this morning. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the first thing I want to touch on this morning is this idea of the family. The, the idea that God calls the family. One of the things that we see in, if you take the Luke account and the Matthew account and put them together is that you see that God calls a family. This is something that un unfortunately is neglected and we see the family today perhaps under attack in ways that we've never seen in our lifetimes. We try and redefine the family. And this isn't happening just outside of the church. This is also happening within the church. I remember when I was in seminary, I took a class on family ministry. It was probably one of my favorite classes in seminary. But people were trying, to, people, even within that class, there were students who were saying, you cannot define the family as husband, wife, kids. You can't. What do you do about the single mom? What do you do about, what about, what about? So consequently, we, define, we redefine the family. And even in so-called churches today, the family is defined as having two dads or two moms or whatever the world defines it. The church is defining the family by the world standards. But what do we see in scripture? We see that when the promised Messiah comes, the promised Messiah comes in the context of the family. There's, something, um, there's a few things that I want to point out that are very pertinent to us as we think of the truth that God calls the family. First of all, there's something unique about what is happening here in this text. First of all, we see both in Luke chapter 1, Luke 1 verse 27 and Matthew 1 18, we see this idea of a betrothal. We see a relationship between Mary and Joseph that is already taking place before the announcement of the coming of the Messiah. And there's an important term that I think is helpful for us to understand. The text tells us, particularly 
in Matthew, in Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his, Mary, his, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, and I'm going to pause there. So what do we mean by betrothal? So this picture up here is actually a picture of, that's an engagement photo for Karen and me. So I tracked this down. So what is, what is it? How is this similar or different to what we experience today? There's something that really is different within the culture at the time. First thing we need to understand is that betrothal is, in a sense, an, ar an arranged engagement. This is something where, depending on what part of the culture, this may have been something where the man and the woman may have had some input or not, but largely this was something arranged between the two families. So it was two families coming together in order to establish a marriage, and they had, I believe, a better understanding than we do that when two people get together, that it's not just simply two people getting together, it's two families coming together. And so, foundationally, betrothal is an arranged, an arranged engagement. Second thing we see is that it typically would last about a year. So I remember when Karen and I were dating, we had, Karen and I met online. We were eHarmony success story. And so I had actually, Karen's parents are here, and I had actually met Karen's dad four years before we were, before we were matched on eHarmony. Had him as a professor. I, you know, I, why he, I don't know why he didn't try and set me up with his daughter back then, but anyway, that's a whole other story. But one of, the, one of the pieces of advice when Karen and I started dating, one of, the, one of my professors, actually was the wife of one of my professors, told me, she said, date through a season of life. And what she meant by that was, give some time to get to know one another. And what you see in this one year time frame is that there was an opportunity for them in a formal setting to get to know one another over a period of time before they got married. So it's not like you were marrying a complete stranger. It wasn't like an arranged marriage and all of a sudden, 30 days later, you find yourself getting married. You had a year to get to know one another. So typically it would last a year. It was also much more formal than our engagements are today. You were, from, for all intents and purposes, married. You were connected. This was an intentional process by which you would get married. So you were considered married except for the fact that you didn't live with one another. There was also, it was, there was no sexual relationship. We see this in Matthew 1, 18, where Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. Well, what's the logical conclusion? The woman that you're betrothed to, the one that you're scheduled, that you're promised to be married to, you find out that she's pregnant. Well, there's only one way that that can happen, right? She must have been unfaithful. Well, as we find out later on, that wasn't exactly the case. But in this betrothal period, there was to be no sexual relationship. You were, you were not, your marriage had not, could not be consummated at this point. And in a sense, this was the test of purity. Would you be faithful to this particular person? Bill was talking about the marriage vows a little bit earlier, and he talked about the obedience part of it. Well, I remember there's another component to traditional vows that says, forsaking all others, I will keep myself only for you. So this 
commitment not to have a sexual relationship during this betrothal period was in a certain sense, this test of purity, that I am going to keep myself only for you and that means I'm getting to know you apart from this sexual sense. So there's no sexual relationship here. And then, similar, this one, this betrothal period would end in only one of two, day, two ways. It would only end in marriage, which was the ideal way, or it would end in divorce. And again, we see this in Matthew, where Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, and Joseph now has a responsibility. He has a decision to make. He can make the decision to send her away and make a, a big spectacle of it. What he could do is he could take this evidence that Mary is pregnant, and he could go to the elders of the city of Nazareth, and he would have every right to publicly separate her. He's been humiliated. He's been embarrassed. His honor is now at stake. And he could send her away. We know from Matthew's account that Joseph being an honorable man, and I would say it was probably a reflection of his genuine love for her, he decides to do it quietly. He exercises another option that he would have, and that is he would find one or two other people who could testify to the fact that she had been unfaithful, quietly write a letter of divorce, ending the relationship right there without making a public spectacle of Mary. But that's really the only way, the only two ways the betrothal could end, either in marriage or in divorce. Another thing we see, and this is something that's very important to us doctrinally as Christians, and that is the idea of the virgin birth. We as Christians believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Going back a hundred years ago, during the controversy between the fundamentalists and the liberals, one of the key fundamentals that the church, that the conservative church leaders held to in a disagreement with those who are liberal was the doctrine of the virgin birth. It was one of the cornerstone things that they held to. But why is the virgin birth important? Why is it so important for us to understand that the Messiah, that Jesus the Christ was born of a virgin. I think there are three ways that we see this, three reasons why. One is that it ensures the Messiah's sinlessness. Now there's this idea that some have that sin is only transmitted from the Father. And the reality is that if the mother has a sin nature, that the child would have a sin nature as well. What we have here where it's the virgin birth that, as we see going back to Luke, where Mary is told that the child, that, the whole, that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the child that she had would be called the Son of God. What we see here is, in a sense, a redemptive work. What we see here is the Holy Spirit coming in, the normal transmission process being interrupted, where God comes in you, and you see, in a sense, the redemptive, a redemptive work taking place, where Jesus as a human, was born without a sin nature, similar to Adam when he was first created. It had to be so in order for the Messiah to be the perfect sacrifice, as we will see in a little bit, in order for him to be 
the second Adam, he had to have a nature similar to the first Adam before the fall. He had to be sinless. The virgin birth ensures that the Messiah was sinless. We see something else here, and that is it affirms the Messiah's deity and humanity. In order for the Messiah to be a representative of humanity, he had to be human. But in order for him to take the wrath of God, he had to be divine. You see, in one person, the uniting of humanity and divinity. We see a clue to this in Philippians 2, verses 5 and 6. Philippians 2, verses 5 and 6, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, or literally among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not, did not consider, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And going on to verse 7, it says, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. The Apostle Paul here is speaking of the fact that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, in obedience to the will of God the Father, <coughs> takes on a human nature. But that could only have happened if there was a virgin conception. If there was a virgin conception in a virgin birth, the uniting of God and man in the womb of Mary. We see a third thing here, and that is the virgin birth confirms salvation's source. Last year, we went through a series talking about the gospel according to the scriptures. And we traced the gospel touching down in various places from Genesis all the way through Revelation. But we see a promise going back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, when God is talking about the curse on Eve for her sin. Genesis 3, 14, the Lord said, actually this is to the serpent, Talking about the curse on the serpent, he says, the Lord said to the serpent, but, you, but because, of you, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, you will eat. The dust you will eat all the days of your life. And then in verse 15, we see this. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. What we see here is a promise concerning the gospel. This is what we call the first giving of the gospel here in Genesis. The promise that the seed of the woman would deal a death blow to the serpent. And here in the virgin birth, we see the fulfillment of the promise of that seed. Paul also says in Galatians chapter four, Galatians chapter four, verses four and five, we see these words. Galatians four, verses four and, four and five, this is what the apostle Paul writes. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Not only does the virgin birth ensure the Messiah's sinlessness and, and affirm the Messiah's divinity, but it also confirms salvation's source. So what we see here is that Jesus the Messiah would have parents. And what do we know about them? First of all, we know that they got married. We see 
at, we see towards the end of Matthew chapter one, verse 24, Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel commanded him and took Mary as his wife. We see that they got married before Jesus was ever born. They got married. He kept her, as we see in verse 25, he kept her as a virgin until after she was born. But they got married. Jesus had parents. He had a mom and a dad. He had parents. God fulfilling his promise through the family. We see that his parents were common. There was nothing that we would consider extraordinary from all external appearances. Joseph was a carpenter. Mary was a young woman who really was probably in her community was not particularly somebody of note. She grew up in a small town. They both grew up in Nazareth, a little out of the way place. They would have been from all external appearances, what we would consider common. But there was something else about them. And that is that they were godly. We see Mary addressed by the angel as one who was favored, literally one who was graced by God. We see Joseph being referred to in Matthew chapter one as one who was righteous. He was a righteous man. He had two people, likely fairly young, Mary probably not much more than maybe 14 or 15. Joseph probably anywhere from 17 to 18 to maybe as old as 20. Who were common and yet godly. We see that God calls the family, and we see the Messiah being born into a family. So, what can we learn from Matthew, from Mary, and from Joseph? What are some of the things that we can learn from Mary and Joseph? It's interesting that there's a difference between the announcements, between Mary's, the announcement to Mary and the announcement to Joseph. In the announcement to Mary, we see the angel physically appearing to Mary. In the announcement to Joseph, we see that the angel appears in a dream. We see Mary speaking to the angel. We hear nothing from Joseph. But it's interesting what we can learn from the announcements to Mary and the announcements to Joseph. The first thing we see is the announcement to Mary. Chronologically, this comes first. And we see that Mary is to be the mother of the divine king. And I think there are three things that we can see from this announcement to Mary. First of all, we see that the child would rule, that the child would rule as king. The promise that we see in the Old Testament is that the, that the Messiah would come through the kingly line of David. Now, likely by this time, there would have been perhaps thousands of people who would be descendants of David. There probably would have been people who would have had more of what we would consider a valid claim. People who maybe had more influence, more power, more wealth, more name recognition. And yet, God chose a common, ordinary couple in order to fulfill his promise that the child would rule as king. Now, this is a promise that I'm sure that 
the people of Jesus' day would have seen as a literal fulfillment that the Roman Empire would be defeated, that once again the nation of Israel would rise, and that there would be a literal king sitting on a literal throne in the city of Jerusalem. That the nation of Israel would be restored to her former glory, to the glory that had been seen in the time of David and Solomon. Yet this points to something different. We don't see this in Jesus' time. This wasn't the purpose, but it ultimately will be fulfilled. There will be a fulfillment of this. It speaks to the royal heritage of this child, and we do see it fulfilled through Mary and Joseph. We see something else. We see that this child would be called holy. We see this in this context, as a matter of fact, specifically, we see that the angel speaks of this child being called the son of the most high, that he will give to him the throne of his father David, that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. The kingdom would have no end. The Holy Spirit would come upon her. And then we see at the end of verse 35 in Luke chapter 1, for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit. But the child is referred to as holy. The sense of being holy can mean being set apart, set apart for a specific purpose. And this child certainly was that. This child was set apart from the womb for a specific purpose. But we also see this earlier in Luke chapter 1 with regard to the angel promising the birth of John. John was set aside for a specific purpose as well. But this is different. This child would be called holy. Holy in the sense, not just of being set apart, but holy in the sense of being sinless and perfect. Jesus was sinless and he was promised to be so in the announcement to Mary. We see something else here. As we heard, the child would be called the Son of God. Now, there are so-called Christian faiths. Think specifically, for instance, of the Mormons who believe that any person is, in a sense, a child of God, that somehow the one that we think of as God had a relationship with some woman, and then out of this we have all of these spiritual children. That's not what we're talking here. We're talking about a unique relationship within the Trinity, the relationship of God the Father to God the Son. This child would be called the Son of God because the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, would overshadow Mary. And in this conception, we see, as we heard a little bit ago when we were talking about the virgin birth, we see the uniting of God and man in one unique person. This child would be unique, would not be absolutely identical to us because this child would not possess a sin nature and this child not only would have a human nature, but this child would have a divine nature. This child would be not only fully human in a sense that I would say we are not, but he would also be fully God. God come in human flesh. When we speak of Emmanuel, this is what we're talking about, and we'll talk about that more here in a, here in a little bit. This child would be called the son of God 
of God. There was something unique about this child. This child was very, from his infancy, this child was God. So what do we see with Joseph? In Joseph, we see that he is the father of the incarnate Savior. Now, we know, as we were speaking of the virgin birth, we know that Jesus was not the biological father of Jesus. Imagine the relationship that that would have been like. Here you have Joseph, who is told that the child that would be born would be born of the Holy Spirit. So now you have a common, albeit righteous, young man who will have the responsibility to be the human father figure to one who has God as his father. Imagine what that would have been like. Imagine what that relationship would have been like. You have a child who is perfect. It's one of my favorite scenes in the film that came out several years ago, The Nativity Story. And Joseph and Mary are traveling to Bethlehem. We'll talk about that next week. Joseph and Mary are talking, and one of the things that, one of the questions that Joseph asks is, what will I be able to teach him? What will I be able to teach him? You have a man who has a sin nature, who has the responsibility of being a father figure to one who is sinless. Imagine the responsibility that you would have. We talked a little bit ago about the differences between the announcement to Mary and the announcement to Joseph. And there's one important piece of information that Gabriel did not tell Mary. But it was a piece of information that Joseph got. And that is that the child would be the savior of his people. Now, in our text, in Matthew, we find out what that looks like. But put yourself in the perspective of people in that time who were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. What sort of savior were you looking for? What sort of liberator, deliverer were you looking for? You knew that in your father Abraham that there had been given a promise that this land would be yours. You knew that in David there was the promise that there would always be a king from his throne King, a king from his line that would be sitting on the throne. And yet throughout your history, you see wars and battles, you see conquests, you see nations that have occupied the territory that God has promised you. Assyria taking the northern ten tribes. Babylon taking the southern two tribes. You'd had the Greeks and now the Romans that had all occupied this land that was to be yours. And you knew of the promise of a deliverer. So what kind of deliverer were you looking for? You were looking for someone who would save you and restore your kingdom. And yet that's not what Joseph was told. Joseph was told that he, would, that he was to name this child that Mary would bear 
Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their oppressors? No, from their sins. The issue in the coming of this young child, the coming of God incarnate, the coming of this God-man was the issue of the heart. It was the issue of sin. Nothing can change until this issue is dealt with. Nothing will be different unless the heart is dealt with. So why did this child come? This child came to deliver the people from their sins. And this is something that Joseph was told, but Mary was not. Now I would imagine like any couple, you're probably, it'll probably come up in conversation. Joseph was not told to keep it from Mary and you can probably expect that not long after Joseph has this dream, he goes and has a conversation with Mary. Tells Mary, hey, you wouldn't believe this dream that I had. I now understand the context. But let me tell you something. I know why he's coming. And he's coming to deal with my sin and your sin. Maybe the reason why Joseph was told is because he would never live to see the event. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us that. But we know he was told. This child would be the savior of his people and he would save his people from their sins. We see something else here. This child would be God with us. We see in Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God is not far from us. God has pursued us. God is the one who pursues us. Because our eyes and our hearts have been darkened by sin. Our ears have been plugged so that on our own we would not hear. On our own we would not seek. On our own we would not and could not pursue God. So God does what none of us would do and God comes to us. God pursues us. God, this eternal, infinite, unlimited God breaks into time, clothes himself in humanity, takes on the very nature of a servant as we saw in Philippians chapter two, and humbling himself. God comes near. This child would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Imagine what was going on in the womb of Mary. Over the period of nine months, you see this little human forming. No different from how a child would form in the womb of any other woman. Only there was something different. We know that children are precious to the Lord, but this one was unique. You think of Mary going to visit Elizabeth. Maybe Mary was physically unaware that she was even pregnant at this point. Maybe the child was just a couple of months old. And she walks in to the house where Elizabeth is, and Elizabeth is probably pretty close to giving birth herself at this point. 
maybe a few months away. And the child that is in Elizabeth's womb jumps for joy because of the presence of this barely noticeable child in Mary's womb. Even in that little moment, God was with them. As we go through this series, we're gonna be talking about this. We're gonna be talking about how God has come to us. Next week, we'll hear about how God comes not just to the family, but God comes to the community. The following week, we're going to hear the story of the shepherds and how through them, we come to understand that Emmanuel comes to those who are near. And then the following week, as we hear the story of the Magi, the wise men, we hear that not only does God come to those who are near, but God comes to those who are far away. We sang the song, Joy to the World, which in reality has more to do with Jesus' second coming than his first, but we sing it this time of year. But in that, there's this line, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. So as we enter the Advent season, prepare him room in your heart and then join with us and sing with all of creation and may he rule your hearts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are a God who has come near to us, that you are a God who desires to have a relationship with people who have rejected you. You are a God who's desired to redeem those who would have no part of you. You are a God who desires to restore those who would be traitors to your crown. God, I pray that as those who are called by your name, that we would understand more and more what it means to have God with us and to have a God who pursues us. Lord, I pray that as you pursue us, may your Holy Spirit work in us so that we would respond in kind. Help us to remember that you are the divine king and the incarnate savior that you have come through a family to make yourself known. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.